So Chris Carboni is Professor in Macroecology and Conservation, and he's the Doctoral Training Programs Coordinator at the ZSL Institute of Zoology. He carries out research in ecology and conservation with a particular interest in carnivores and vertebrate predators, and he has over 150 publications to his name. And he's joined this evening by Jess Rose Turner, who's a fourth year PhD student on that um, training program, and was she supervised by Chris, and, and she was also um, involved with Queen Mary College at the University of London. Her project also has a partnership with the People's Trust for Endangered Species, and her research focuses on hedgehogs in London using a combination of modelling and looking at the genetics. So I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Jess for the first, first part of this evening's talk. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I hope you can all see my screen. Yep. Um, thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share my work with you tonight, uh, which I've been looking at the impact of urban environments on London's hedgehog populations. So this evening, first, I'm going to give a bit of a background into why it's useful to use genetic approaches to study urban wildlife. And then I'll talk about the methods that I've used during my study and also some of our key findings. So cities like London form very distinctive ecosystems. And on one hand, these can present many challenges for wildlife populations with high levels of pollution, noise and light disturbance, as well as densely built infrastructure such as roads and buildings, and also high numbers of people. But at the same time, there are also many opportunities for wildlife, such as high food availability, fewer of the large predators that are less able to tolerate human presence, and also a wide range of varied habitat uh, opportunities. And together, these really highly dynamic and highly modified environments exert strong pressures on the wildlife that live within them. And this can lead to many and varied changes in these photographs on the slides. Uh, this squirrel is eating some possibly quite unhealthy uh, human waste food from out of a bin. And this fox is also behaving quite boldly by sitting at somebody's table and also by being out during the day. And so understanding how wildlife are being impacted by urban environments will have a very important role in promoting healthy and sustainable biodiversity in cities for the future. And a key uh, particular challenge that urban wildlife can face is habitat fragmentation which uh, can be extremely severe, as you can see in this photograph of East London. And if I were to highlight the green spaces in this picture, you can see that they're quite small and separated by a dense matrix of roads, buildings and railways. And for highly mobile species like birds, who, which, but for many small animals that rely on natural green spaces and are less able to move through this built up environment, it can have very strong and detrimental effects on their populations. And I'm just going to illustrate this using a hypothetical population, um, which start by being very widespread in the landscape, but can then be increasingly restricted to the remaining uh, patches of green space habitats. And as these can only support smaller populations, the small populations are at, are at an increased risk of a process known as genetic drift, in which the genetic variation that you find within populations can randomly um, vary and become lost completely or fixed within populations over time. Uh, and through this, you can end up with uh, populations with reduced levels of diversity, which is quite concerning for their conservation because uh, population genetic diversity is important for them to be able to retain time. As there are fewer individuals within these populations, you can also end up with higher levels of inbreeding, 
uh, as there's fewer potential mates, which leads to less healthy individuals as well. And these populations may also be uh, more isolated as it's harder for um, them to move between these green spaces, such as barriers, uh, as they face barriers, such as high fences or roads. And this means that the introduction of new individuals and new genetic variation to these populations is reduced and can even lead to the populations becoming more dissimilar over time as the different characteristics in another. And this process is described uh, by the urban fragmentation model, which I'll explain as it helps to provide a framework to understand the work that I did in this study. And this predicts that as you go from a non-urban natural landscape into urban environments, the genetic diversity within wildlife populations decreases as they have smaller population sizes and higher levels of genetic drift, which is a process through which genetic diversity can be lost. On the other hand, um, the differences between them are expected to increase as the connectivity and movement between the populations is reduced. But how does this relate to what we see in hedgehogs? And it still remains uh, quite uncertain how the urban environment is impacting hedgehogs, as there's been very little previous work into this. And the studies that have been done have been quite contradictory. So a research paper that was done in Zurich, for example, found that urban hedgehogs formed three main subpopulations, which were separated by transport route in the city. Whereas a study that was carried out recently in Berlin found that there was actually widespread gene flow across the city. And a study in Helsinki uh, in Finland, which actually compared both the um, urban area and its surroundings, found no population genetic structure when they used uh, nuclear DNA markers. But when they used a slightly different approach, they found some slight evidence that there could be some differences between the urban and rural areas. And so the aims of this project were to examine whether hedgehog populations within Greater London show signs of being isolated by the urban. This would be identifiable by low levels of genetic diversity and high levels of genetic differentiation. And so in order to do this, we use single nucleotide polymorphism markers or SNPs. And so to give a bit more information about the type of genetic variation that we're looking at, a single SNP refers to a change in the DNA that occurs at a single site in an individual's genetic sequence. As shown here, uh, the orange bar represents a change in the genetic sequence seen in individual A compared to individual B. And within individuals, these changes are very common, and so we can use next generation sequencing and target capture approaches in order to identify many thousands of these unlinked variable SNP sites across the genome. And in our study, we find just to look at the fine scale population analysis of hedgehogs. And so we had to first collect our samples and between 2020 to 2022, we collected hedgehog tissue samples opportunistically from around London and also from the surrounding areas, as these would provide an important comparison uh, to understand the uh, results that we'd get from within the city. Uh, this was through road kills, rescue centres, uh, the ZSL Garden Wildlife Health Project, as well as general calls such as this one, which was actually put out through the uh, uh, London Natural History Society's website. This was then followed by several months of lab work uh, to extract the DNA, as shown in the top photos, and also preparing it to the sequence. And this then returned very large data files containing men. We used various bioinformatic approaches to extract our markers and to explore the genetic structure of our hedgehogs. So overall, we obtained just over 100 samples, 
uh, which we analysed both for the region as a whole and for a subset of eight local populations. These included four populations from towns just north of the city, in Welling Garden City, Hatfield, St Albans and the London Colney area, which are towns separated by agricultural landscapes. And then we also looked at four locations within London at the Lee Valley, Hampstead Heath, Barnes and Regent's Park areas. And these are separated by much more densely built up urban environments. So first we then we looked at how genetically diverse our populations were by comparing the observed heterozygosities and expected heterozygosities within each population. And the heterozygosities is just um, a measure of the genetic variation that we see in the populations. And so we can see that within our four London sites that there is a uh, much lower levels of genetic diversity compared to the sites north of London where it's quite high and quite stable among populations. We then looked at each pair of populations and compared how different they were um, compared to all of the other populations. And that's shown in this uh, plot here, in which um, the colors indicate the level of differentiation between the populations. So um, <clears throat> blue indicates that the populations are not very different from each other, and red indicates uh, that there is a much higher level of difference. And we can see here that the four populations outside of London show very low levels of uh, differences between them, whereas the populations within London show very high levels of genetic differentiation. And in particular, I can point out Regent's Park population, which is the most central of our London hedgehog populations and shows very high levels of differentiation uh, from all of the other populations that we studied. We then looked across the entire region uh, using a software called Structure, which is widely used in population genetics analysis and assigns individuals quite a broad indication of the change in population genetic variation across the study area. So Regent's Park was found to be an outlier and so has been excluded from this for ease of understanding. But amongst the remaining <coughs> uh, samples from our data set, we can see that there are seven potential popu major population clusters that are identified. As you go further north across our study area, you get more of the um, orange indicating it's cluster four. And as you go further south of London, you get more of this pink uh, population cluster, uh, which is cluster six. But also in the middle, you can see that within London, you get quite distinct areas of green, blue, and yellow, which align with our Hampstead, Lee Valley, and Barnes area samples as well as areas just north of this where we have quite, <clears throat> where we have some more sort of blue and green. However, as each pie chart on this map represents one of our individual samples, you can see that many of the individuals belong to a mixture of two or three different uh, colors, which indicates that it's being assigned to two or three or maybe even four of the different populations by the software. And this is quite interesting, as it suggests that rather than forming very distinct clustering across, and <clears throat> so rather than forming very distinct and defined clusters across our study area, there's more of a gradient of change in the genetic variation as you move sort of between south to north across our study area. And so I mentioned that Regent's Park was excluded from this analysis as it was found to be very genetically different from all of the other populations and samples that we had in our, um, so that we had in our data set. And why is this? Uh, so Regent's Park is known to be the last remaining stronghold of a central London, of hedgehogs in a central London park. And they've been lost from most of the other central parks um, over the past 50 years. And it's likely that this population is representing um, a population that's experiencing an extreme level of urban pressure and isolation. 
as this habitat suitability map uh, produced, if I overlay this so with a habitat suitability map that I produced using citizen science records at the start of my PhD, where green represents areas of high habitat suitability with low habitat suitability, we can see that Regent's Park itself, though it is a though it is a good habitat for hedgehogs, is surrounded by areas that are in much lower suitability and possibly quite challenging for hedgehogs to move between. <clears throat> Fortunately, however, this particular population is quite well monitored, and so this will allow uh, management to be able to be implemented and address this. And so to conclude, these analysis uh, presented here show evidence that the hedgehog populations within London are being impacted by habitat fragmentation with reduced genetic diversity and lower connectivity, uh, particularly in the Regent's Park population in central London. And these findings are quite relevant for uh, ensuring uh, hedgehogs uh, conservation within Greater London, as it indicates that and maintaining strong connectivity uh, among suitable habitat will be important for their long term viability. However, it's also important to note that there's also a lot more future work that needs to be done to understand further complexities in these patterns. Uh, for example, with much larger sample sizes and greater coverage of more areas of London that will also be important. So thank you very much for listening. And I'd like to thank my funders, my supervisors and our collaborators, as well as the many volunteers who helped to provide data for this project. Thanks very much, Jess. That's really, yeah, that's really fascinating. We're gonna hold any, so please put chats, put questions into the chat. Um, we'll, what we'll do is we'll wait till the end after Chris's presentation and then we'll uh, address all the questions then, but do pop things in. Um, I'm, I've already got a couple of questions that I might try and sneak in. So if you could stop sharing now, Jess, that'd be great. And then we're gonna hand over to Chris. Hi everyone. Firstly, can you hear me okay? And yep, that's can fine. you see, and you can see my slides? Yes, we can. Perfect. All right. I'm hoping that the everything works okay from here. Um, yeah, so so following on from Jess's work, um, I'm gonna give you a very kind of um a broad overview of the London Hogwatch project, which Jess is a part of. Um, and and just gonna give you an update since the times when I gave, I think I gave a talk here. Uh, a couple of years ago. So um, yeah, just to give you a brief update. Um, so London Hogwatch has been um, a project which is collaboration with a number of people. Kate Scott Getty is our project manager. We've got a number of, we've got Izzy and Chloe and Bella who are research technicians. Jess, uh, who you've met, and Ben are PhD students associated with the project. Uh, and Ben is now finished his PhD and joined us as a postdoc. Um, so London Hogwatch has been going since 2016. The focus of the work here is to use camera traps, surveys and other information like Jess's genetics work um, uh, and citizen science information to understand uh, better the distributions of hedgehogs across greater London. Our aim is that with this greater understanding and, and really targeted, we, we can more uh, effectively target conservation efforts across the capital, really also helping to inspire local groups to to engage in, in hedgehog conservation, but also uh, urban wildlife more generally. Uh, to date, uh, we've conducted over 100 surveys um, across uh, about 60 percent of London boroughs. In total, we've put out about 3000 camera traps placements. Um, we've, we've involved probably around 1,500, although it's not a very precise number of volunteers over the years, um, hosted over 30 students, including PhD students, master's students, undergrads, and, um, and secondary school students as well. So a really broad range of people, loads, you know, loads of different volunteers and students and, and different groups. So it's been a really enjoyable process doing this project. 
um, as a sort of typical annual activity that we have, we kind of work along the schedule of the hedgehogs themselves, really. So become active in the field uh, between April and October time. Uh, that's when we carry out most of our surveys, when the hedgehogs are out and about foraging and getting on with their business. Um, in September to February, we kind of then are focused more, we start focusing a bit more on the data analysis side and the writing up of reports for our partners. Um, February, March, we might spend a bit of time as well, sort of planning, not only reporting back to the overall findings, but planning the new surveys for the coming year. Uh, surveys can vary from small camera trap surveys of one or two cameras, sometimes individual cameras in people's back gardens to large surveys of the large parks up to about 150 um, cameras. Um, we get a range of different mammal species and um, many, many different species of ground feeding birds. Uh, I don't I'm not sure what the total count we have is, but uh, recently, um, in Hampstead Heath, uh, we calculated something like nearly 40 species of birds in that one survey. So quite a range. So this allows us not only to get hedgehog presence and absence, but also many other species, which in turn may affect the hedgehogs themselves, but also give us a broader understanding of wildlife in, uh, in urban settings. Uh, it can be used to look at species interaction, broader general biodiversity. It can be used also uh, to understand the relationship between people and wildlife and urban parks. Humans are by far the most prevalent common species in our record. Um, and, and we can use this data to understand and interpret how wildlife coexists with humans, where they might avoid them in certain areas where there's a lot of human walking around and a lot of acti human activity, or whether they might adjust time periods of activity or locations of activity at certain times of the day um, to minimize uh, you know, having to be disturbed by them. We even get extraordinary sightings. Like a few years ago, we found uh, a pine marten in Kingston in Southwest London. Pine martens, this was a, a sighting that was probably the first of its kind for over a century. Uh, in Greater London. So it was really quite extraordinary and attracted quite a lot of interest in, um, in the UK press. Now, Jess very well explained how, you know, human, uh, habitat fragmentation is one of the key sort of threats to urban hedgehogs. And I just wanted to give you a very specific example. She's already mentioned that Regent's Park is the most central breeding population in London that we know of. Um, and, and also that Hampstead Heath, interestingly, is one of the biggest uh, hedgehog populations we found in, in London. Um, and interesting, Jess's work shows that Hampstead Heath is also has quite a, 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 a good level of genetic diversity, making it more comparable with those kind of more rural populations further north outside of Greater London. Whereas uh, there's much more inbreeding and sort of um, lower genetic diversity in Regent's Park. Now, this, this, these slides show you kind of the challenges that hedgehogs have in, in breaching and in, in bridging these two population areas. Um, normally, if this was all green pastures, uh, a hedgehog could, could cover the distance of about one and a half miles between the two sites uh, in an evening of foraging. But although if you look at the maps overhead, uh, kind of satellite image, of the different areas across this, the, the gap between these two parts. It looks pretty green and there's lots of private gardens. When you look at pra in practice at what it would be like for a hedgehog to walk between these sites, you see there are a lot of, um, you know, a lot of barriers along the way, big roads, bridges, railway tracks, all sorts of things to stop them from moving between sites. In addition to human infrastructure uh, causing issues with hedgehog dispersal and habitat fragmentation, we do get some effects of other urban wildlife on hedgehogs. So one of the things we found is over the years when we've been doing our surveys in Southwest London, we found that generally speaking, hedgehogs and badgers don't seem to coexist terribly well. Where there are lots of badgers, we don't tend to find hedgehogs. So this map of red point shows you where we've seen hedgehogs around the Barnes and Roehampton area, and then further to the Southwest where 
uh, the bigger open uh, public green spaces, we find that badgers have taken over these areas and generally we don't see any hedgehogs at all. These two species compete a lot for food, but in addition to that, badgers include hedgehogs in their diet. So they're not only a competitor, but a potential predator as well. Now, since this work was done, we've actually seen a couple of sites where we do see the two species overlapping in distribution. And um, it could be that there's some areas where the habitat is diverse enough that allows the two species to live side by side. Surely over the years across the UK and across Europe, the two species have coexisted, but probably in urban environments, generally speaking, it's hard to see them kind of, uh, they, they probably, it makes it that much more difficult for hedgehogs to survive in, in an urban environment. So uh, we are seeing some examples of overlap, but we think generally speaking, um, there, is, there is a bit of a um, competition there. We mentioned earlier that Hampstead Heath uh, is one of the most important hedgehog sites we've found so far. Um, it's an area which is well connected to the surrounding sort of areas of um, suburban uh, North London. And uh, we, we've seen over two big surveys of 150 cameras uh, in 2018 and 2021, a nice distribution of hedgehogs across the park. Um, I think this is one of the largest continuous dis contiguous distributions we've seen so far in our surveys. Um, and we're going to repeat this survey again into this year, in the spring, and hopefully we'll have a better sense of longer term trends in the area. We've seen a slight decline in the sighting rate between the two surveys from the past one to the present, the most recent one. But there's also been some differences in methodology use, which might explain for those differences. But what's good news, generally speaking, is that they're clearly widespread across the park. We also see in uh, Hampstead Heath a uh, lovely diversity of birds. I mentioned something like almost 40 species of ground feeding birds here. Um, and those appear in the record and can be used to better understand how the birds are using these very, very um, well used uh, uh, and popular areas for, for, for visitors in the park, how they use these areas uh, for feeding. So one of the huge challenges we have with the project is data processing. So in a big survey like Hampstead Heath, we can easily get 2 million or more photographs in one survey. Um, and when we look at the sort of distribution of the photos, well, as I said before, humans are, are one of the most common <laughs> species in these records. And I would say, you know, just as a guesstimate, you know, we often get around half the photos um, of people, in, certainly in the public, um, well, uh, frequently used uh, visited parks. Then in the summer, and when the vegetation's warm and it's kind of breezy, we also, the cameras are triggered by moving vegetation. So we get a number of blank photos. So about three quarters of these images might be humans and blanks. Um, and a big development in the last couple of years that we've been uh, using is, uh, is um, uh, machine learning tools like uh, the Mega Detector, which is a Microsoft tool, which not only allows us to identify the human photos and extract them, put them aside, but also identifies blanks where there are no, no animals and allows us then to look at the remaining quarter of the images to focus on the other uh, mammal and bird species that are in the record. Of these, only about one-tenth of one percent are of hedgehogs, so they really represent a very tiny fraction of the total, total record, but um, the mag detector and other tools that we're using now can help us to kind of find those much more quickly and efficiently, but also to extract really useful information about other day active species like the birds and fo some foxes to some extent and other, other uh, small mammals. So here's an example of the mega detector finding individuals in the, in the photos. So got hedgehogs moving around and there's a little bounding box that the mega detector finds. And we're hoping also to be able to use this to get further insights into the behavior uh, and, and possibly to use it to infer animal abundance at a later stage um, with some of the tools that we've been developing. Here's another example of a fox. And again, the mega detector is finding this, these, this fox individual. <clears throat> and here's some daytime animals. I don't know if you can still see the bounding boxes, but they're two deer. These are all photos from Bushy Park, another big survey we did last year. So 
in addition to the challenge of sort of going through the data, we also need to develop uh, improved data pipelines to, to handle the sheer volumes of data that we get. So we've been working on that with other big partners. Um, we've been partnered up with Network Rail doing some work around Greater London, but we also are part of a UK-wide network of camera trapping surveys of hedgehogs and other mammals called the National Hedgehog Monitoring Program, which is funded by Natural England. And there we're helping them develop a kind of bigger uh, data pipeline to help us store the data safely, um, analyze it more efficiently using AI tools, you know, also engaging some public um, websites like, well, this, I've got Instant Wild and Zooniverse here, but with the mammal, uh, with a national hedgehog monitoring program, we're using mammal web as well, uh, which can then all feed into sort of the analysis, which give us ecological insights on the long-term population trends of hedgehogs and other species. Another form of, of data that we've been using, citizen science data from groups like Giggle from the, uh, and the, some other uh, national programs, which use uh, citizen science sightings of a range of different species. And we focused on four um, urban mammals, hedgehogs, badgers, foxes, and squirrels. And uh, Jess has been involved in, in one of these in a, this work using um, these data along with habitat data and habitat features she referred to in her talk to come up with a habitat suitability maps. And what's really interesting is these highlight in the red areas, areas that are thought to be the most suitable sites for, for that species uh, in Greater London. And what you find for, for hedgehogs and badgers is that they tend to be, the most favored sites tend to be out in the more residential areas outside the city, the built up city center. So they have a sort of donut shaped area of habitat suitability around the edge of central London. Whereas for two other species, which are clearly very well adapted to urban environments, foxes and squirrels, it's almost the opposite. The models actually predict the best spaces for them to be are right near central London. I'm not sure whether I completely uh, believe these models, and but but they, in terms of you know the very best places for foxes and squirrels are right in the center, but it just shows you how well adapted these animals are for urban environments. And again, this works well with understanding or using our camera trap data to interpret and understand better where these animals might be and helps us target future surveys. We've also been doing a lot of work with reaching out to the public about the kinds of work we do. So Kate, here's Kate Scott Gatti, who is our um, project manager I mentioned earlier. And she was part of a video, which was part of the British Library's exhibit of uh, animals, art, science, and sound. Um, and she featured there with this, and that she could see a, a photo of, with Jeff Fargo, who works a lot with us as well in Hampson Heath and around the area. And uh, yeah, so this was a, a really nice exhibit uh, showing off the work of London Hogwash. So with that, I would just like to close by thanking my team, the wider team, including Jess and the others um, in their efforts for the project. Our partners, which are many fold, um, and apologies if I've missed anybody out. We, we struggled to get all the people in one slide. And our funders, with a particular thanks to the British Hedgehog Preservation Society, or BHPS, who have been our long-term funders and very important parts of uh, part of our, our project. Thank you very much. That's, that's it. Thank you very, yeah, thank you very much to both of you. Um, I really enjoyed both of those presentations. Um, I'm, and, Little trouble.